Good evening. I am Stephanie Tomlinson, Assistant Director of Alumni Relations for the College of Education. Welcome to the 2021 Cooking Classic. We're so fortunate to be presenting this event in partnership with the Penn State Alumni Association and with the following colleges, Agricultural Sciences, Information Sciences and Technology, Nursing and the Schreier Honors College, along with the following Commonwealth campuses, Abington, Altoona, Behrend, Harrisburg, Schoolkill and World Campus. Each Wednesday night, we're gonna feature a different theme. So make sure you check out them all. Before we talk about tonight's presentation, we would like to acknowledge the hard work of the College of IST Student Organization User Experience Professionals Association, or UXPA for short, for their incredible work on the marketing materials for the Cooking Classic. They are a top-notch project management organization, and we're very impressed with their professionalism and abilities. Thank you, UXPA. Also, in addition to this event being a fantastic collaborative opportunity for the alumni relations staff at Penn State, one of the reasons we're hosting the Cooking Classic is to raise awareness of the continual plight of students' food insecurity. Later tonight, we're gonna to share a link for those of you who wish to donate to one of Penn State's food pantries. Tonight, we're presenting Fresh from the Farm Show, and our special guest is gonna share her delicious homemade pierogi recipe, and then discuss how she and her team prepared for the Pennsylvania Farm Show virtual event this year. Note that if you have any questions during tonight's event, please post them in the Q&A. That's at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to those after our guest is done presenting. Before we get started, we have another guest here with us this evening, Mr. Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Stephanie. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? On behalf of our 720,000 alumni that we have worldwide and the 175,000 members that make up the world's largest alumni association, welcome to the Cooking Classic. Over the next four weeks, you're gonna experience some of the great tastes that Penn Staters have to offer. And so I'm so excited for this program. You know, great universities bring alumni and friends together in so many different ways to celebrate. We come together to celebrate football. We come to celebrate the arts. We come together to celebrate the great academic endeavor here at Penn State. And I can't wait until we can get back together and once again, celebrate in person. And tonight we're gonna to celebrate food. You know, food is a big part of the Penn State culture, right? You think about grilled stickies and the chicken Cosmos that they used to serve in West Dining Hall. Um, your favorite tailgate fair and the, and the menus that you all put together when you're tailgating to, before we cheer on our Nittany Lions. And of course, creamery ice cream. Food is a big part of, of Penn State and the Penn State culture. And tonight we're going to celebrate another, uh, another great piece of that, and that's pierogies. I grew up in northeastern Pennsylvania. Pierogies were always on the menu, whether it was in our home growing up or going out to one of the local church festivals, it was always a, a must have. And so we have a great program lined up for you tonight. Uh, Stephanie mentioned all the colleges and campuses that are involved in tonight's program, but I see people um, shouting out things in the chat. Go ahead and tell us which college you're from and which campus you might've attended and give a shout out to your connection to Penn State. Uh, I'll let people go ahead and do that. You know, being connected to the alumni societies of these colleges and campuses is just a great way to stay involved with Penn State. And so I encourage you, if you are interested in getting involved with one of our alumni societies for the colleges and campuses or your local chapters, you can find information about how you can get involved on our website at alumni.psu.edu. You could also get involved with our many virtual events that we have been hosting, whether it's our virtual speaker series events, uh, yoga night, which is coming up soon, or Wednesday morning coffee hours that I host with some accomplished alumni. You can find all of those events on our website at alumni.psu.edu slash events. I know many people on here are members of the Penn State Alumni Association. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. 
If you're not a member yet, what are you waiting for? Go out to our website and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. Stephanie mentioned uh, earlier, uh, but I think it's worth mentioning again, we're going to be doing a little bit of fundraising tonight to support uh, the students who face food insecurity on all of our campuses across the Commonwealth. Keep an eye out for that link when they drop that into the chat. You know, a, a gift as small as $5 can really help and be, mean the difference between a student having a meal that night and a student not being able to eat. And so we encourage you to support the Lions Pantries all over the Commonwealth and all over the Penn State system. Congratulations to everybody who has organized tonight. Thank you for inviting me to share a few words. Thank you for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are Penn State. Thank you so much, Paul. Without further ado, I would love to welcome tonight's presenter, Morgan Firestein. Morgan, who's originally from Wommelsdorf, Pennsylvania, earned her bachelor's degree in agricultural business management from Penn State in 2008. After graduation, Morgan became an animal science educator for Penn State Cooperative Extension, serving Berks and Schuylkill counties. In that role, she developed free educational programs for livestock and dairy farmers and assisted them in identifying opportunities and finding solutions to animal science related issues. Morgan received her MBA from Delaware Valley University. And currently she's the commercial events manager at the Pennsylvania Farm Show Complex and Expo Center in Harrisburg. Her responsibilities include managing the diverse events held there throughout the year, including the Keystone Classic State Barbecue Championship. Morgan resides with her husband, Kyle Hefner, and son, Hudson, near her family's farm in Berks County. In her spare time, she enjoys helping on the farm and cooking farm fresh meals for her family. Now I'm going to turn the program over to Morgan so she can tell us all about her famous pierogies. Morgan? Thank you, Stephanie. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all into my home in Berks County. As Stephanie mentioned, I'm a graduate of Penn State College of Ag Sciences, and my family and I are still strong supporters of the Penn State University. We, like so many other people, really enjoy the football home games in the fall um, at Penn State. And you can always find us tailgating with our pierogies. So you have to visit our tailgate and try some of our pierogies. Because as uh, Paul mentioned, they are the perfect tailgate snack. So pierogies are a form of dumpling and there are many types of dumplings around the world. But pierogies are actually the Polish version of dumpling. Although I am not Polish, I am a huge foodie and you can always find me in the kitchen making new recipes as well as some family favorites. So, um, I love all dough foods, and I think this is uh, because of my Italian heritage. My grandmother and my mother always had um, homemade pastas and sauces in their home, and I grew up that way. So without further ado, let's go to our pierogi recipe, the star of the show. So the recipe actually is a potato-filled pierogi recipe, and it is National Cheese Day, so what better way to celebrate is with cheddar cheese. So we're going to actually start with our filling, which is the easiest part of our pierogi recipe. The filling is something that you can do two days in advance or a day in advance, or even the day that you're making pierogies. So a lot of times when I'm making pierogies, um, the only reason why I'm making pierogies is because I have leftover mashed potatoes and I don't know what else to do with them. So I'll take my mashed potatoes and convert them into a delicious filling for the inside of the pierogi. But if you're not starting that way and you wanna start from scratch, you really wanna use um, any type of potato that your family is favorite um, that enjoys. So I like to actually use a local product and these are actually from Higgins, Pennsylvania, um, which is in Schuylkill County. These are baby gold potatoes, and I actually like to mix my potatoes. So my filling actually 
is a combination of the baby gold potatoes as well as some red potatoes. So I start with the potatoes and I would boil the potatoes off. And once they are pork uh, soft, then I would drain the water, peel the potatoes and start mashing my potatoes. So after I'm done mashing my potatoes to a, to a mashed potato consistency, then I would actually take my cheddar cheese. And this is actually a local cheddar cheese. This is from Lancaster County from Pied Weaver. Um, and then I just shredded it right before I was ready to make my filling. And I would take my seasonings and add that to my mashed potatoes, as well as some milk, some butter. Um, some people add some sour cream or uh, cream cheese to their mixture. So any way you make mashed potatoes, that's how you start the filling. So my actual secret ingredient to um, a delicious pierogi is actually ranch seasoning. So it adds the extra kick that when you taste that pierogi, there's um, the garlic, the onion, and all the great flavors that ranch dressing, ranch seasoning actually provides. So here is my already finished filling. You can see the ranch flakes, the cheddar cheese, the deliciousness of the mashed potatoes. Um, and we're just gonna put this to side because we don't need this quite yet. All right, so moving on to our dough, which is my favorite part of this recipe. What you're going to do is you're going to put your flour in your bowl. And I actually use my KitchenAid mixer. It's easy to use, it's quick, efficient. So I use everything um, just inside the bowl. So I am going to take a fork or you can use a spoon and you just make a well like so. And I'm going to connect it. And inside my well is actually all my dry ingredients. So we're going to add salt. We're going to add our butter. <clears throat> The egg goes inside the well. And the milk. So my milk actually is a local milk. It comes from Clover Farms right in Berks County. The eggs actually came from a local chicken farmer. Um, the butter is actually Lando Lakes butter. I just love the flavor of Lando Lakes and we are supporting the local farmer um, because there are dairy farms that ship to Lando Lakes here in Berks County. So what I'm going to do next is um, use my dough hook for the KitchenAid mixer. I'm just going to connect it. And I am a little short, so I do have to use my tippy toes here. Make sure your KitchenAid mixer is connected and latched, and then you can start mixing. So while that's mixing, we actually add our water gradually. So I am using warm water. Um, for this mixture. So traditionally, when you make dough and you don't have a KitchenAid mixer, most times you'll just put your flour on your surface, your clean surface, um, and then you make your well, as I showed you, with the, uh, with inside my bowl, and add all your, your wet ingredients inside the well, of the flour and then you're gradually using your fork to gradually mix the flour um, and the liquid ingredients and then once you come to a ball consistency um, then that's when you start kneading your dough now if you're not going to use your KitchenAid mixer you will want to knead your dough for at least five minutes um, since we're using our KitchenAid mixer and I'm just going to add a little bit of more water here I really can just let the KitchenAid mixer do the work. Of course, I'm not leaving the KitchenAid mixer's side the whole time, but I am watching to make sure it is the perfect consistency and my KitchenAid mixer needs to knead the dough for at least three minutes. Now, another reason why I love the KitchenAid mixer, and this is not a KitchenAid commercial, I promise you, I just love my mixer so much. Um, another 
the reason why I use it is because I constantly need my hands free at all times. I have a little child as well as two dogs that are constantly just flying around the house and I never can just have a free moment to have dirty hands. So my mixer allows me to have clean hands at all times. So we are almost at a great consistency and I am just going to quickly show that to you. So you can see that and it is not ready yet. Just want to quickly show that to you. And we're gonna keep mixing. So we're just gonna keep going there for another three minutes, another two minutes or so while that mixes. Sometimes you need to actually add a little bit more water to the mixture because it, it doesn't quite mix properly. Um, just gonna keep that going. All right. And for time's sake, I'm actually going to disconnect it. And I'm gonna get my plastic wrap out. So this dough, um, you really don't wanna work with this dough right, right like this. You want your dough to be pliable and soft. And to do that, you take your dough and let it rest. That's the most important step in, um, and pierogi making. So we're just gonna dump out our dough. And since we're not using this dough tonight, we are gonna stick it in the refrigerator, but I am gonna show you the kneading technique. So this is a quick technique of how you knead this dough. And you really like to use some elbow grease to get in there. And this should, if you're not using your mixer, you wanna do this for about five minutes or so, just to get all of the dough mixed. And so we are actually gonna stop there. I would keep going though, um, if I was using this dough to make the, the pierogies. So we're just going to put it in the middle of our plastic wrap. And I'm terrible at cutting plastic wrap, hate plastic wrap, but it, it works really well with dough. So we're just gonna fold that dough like that. And we're gonna put it off to the side because it will need to rest for 30 minutes or so. Alternatively, you can actually just stick it in the fridge and forget about it um, and work on your dough the next day um, or whenever you're ready to make your pierogies. So we are now gonna use the refrigerated dough that I have, the magic of TV. It's already ready. All right, and we are going to, and I did clean my surface. You definitely want a clean surface when you are working on your countertop like this. And I'm just gonna throw my dough on top, add a little bit more flour. And a lot of times when I'm rolling dough out, um, I actually use parchment paper because it is just so much, um, more efficient. And I tend to, because I'm not a professional at all, I just love cooking. Um, I tend to use too much flour. So a nice little trick that actually my mom taught me um, is that I would lay parchment paper out on my surface, put my dough on that parchment paper with a little tiny bit of flour, and then put another piece of parchment paper on top of that dough. So you're actually using your rolling pin on top of the parchment paper. So I am not showing you that technique tonight because I think that most people just work on a clean surface with some flour. So we are just gonna get this really, really nice and thin, about a one eighth inch, I'm sorry, yes, one eighth inch thickness. Sorry about that. As fast as possible. And it really doesn't have to be perfect because in the old days, you know, people would just um, do their best that they can. And pierogies are all about a labor of love. Um, it's a lot of work making 
fresh dough products and anyone consuming a homemade pierogi knows how much work is going into it. So the next part, my dough seems to be pretty good. Little thin in certain areas, but that is quite all right. We will have to deal with that. So the next part of this process is actually cutting out your little pierogi circles. And they are definitely the cutest pierogi circles. Um, so what I like to use is actually a biscuit cutter or a three inch round um, cookie cutter will work. You can also, if you don't have that, I wouldn't go out and buy it. Pierogies are definitely not about um, the perfect tool to use to make them. Just use whatever you have. So this is actually just a glass. You can, you can just use that. You just get in there, make your little circle. And since I have this, I am going to use it. You can see that sometimes your circles just aren't perfect and that's okay because we're not professionals here. So I'm just going to make some circles. And if I was doing this um, not on TV or for the camera, I would be reusing this dough as well. Um, but since we're only showing you a little bit here, those are all my circles. And now this is the part that I love with pierogi making. Have I said that a lot? I love the whole process. Your filling. So you already have your filling ready to go. Um, you have your circles ready to go. You need a little plate of water and you probably can't see that very well, um, but there is some water in there and a cookie scoop. Um, this is actually a small cookie scoop and not a mini cookie scoop. I would definitely recommend using the mini cookie scoop. It works a lot better. Um, you can get the right, the right amount of filling um, for each circle, um, but I don't have it. So we're not gonna use that. So, we're just gonna go in and I actually, since my, my amount is not the amount that I need, I'm just gonna go in, make my filling. I actually have too much here. You really just want a little tiny ball. All right, and you can see the mini cookie scoop works really well, um, or a cookie scoop in general works really well. So this is the part where you just take your filling, make sure it is in the middle of your dough, like so. And you can tell that this dough was sitting in the fridge for a little bit because it is nice and soft, not too sticky, not too dry, um, but it is the perfect texture. You take your finger, dip it in a little water, and you're just gonna go along one side of your pierogi. So you can see how wet that is, and you're just going to fold on top. And you want to make sure that all the dough is inside because if you if you have some leakage there like I just had right there then when you're ready to boil them they actually pop open and then you don't have pierogies anymore you actually have a potato filling leakage in your water so there's my pierogi and to make them fancy I would go along with my fork and I just make them look a little more fancy, like so. And we'll show you again what this looks like. Um, one note, I do make this in small batches. I cut out my dough in small batches just because this dough does dry out very quickly. So I tend to make just a little bit, stuff them, pinch, and 
and then I boil them. Or alternatively, you can actually just make them all and then cover them right away. There's really no special technique. It's just, you know, after you do it a few times, you gain the practice and dough is all about practice, so. So this is the part of my program that actually I tell you a really, really bad joke. So why did the pierogi cross the road? To get pinched, of course. <laughs> uh, my husband's on the other side of the camera uh, sighing because he's embarrassed of my jokes. But you always have to tell a really bad joke. So going to continue here. Pinch, pinch, pinch. And you can always feel um, the air pockets when you're pinching. So you know that you need to pinch a little bit harder and make sure that it's totally closed. And then you fork it to make them pretty. Because who likes to eat um, ugly food? No one really. Everyone likes pretty food. It's all about the experience of a pretty presentation. So pierogies are really a labor of love, as I mentioned, and um, they take time. And when you make them, the people that enjoy them, they know that you've put a lot of hard work into them. So you really just need to pinch, pinch, pinch as I show you this. And I am definitely not a professional pierogi maker. I think I've said that a few times already, but I am trying to go a little fast so we can get everything in for you. All right, here are my pierogies one more time. A little water, fold over, pinch, 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 feel for air pockets. And sometimes you don't have enough water and you just add some more. And really you don't even need the water, you just need to make sure that your dough is soft and pliable enough that you can just get them all pinch together. So some of those pierogies look a little sad, uh, but others look very pretty. And that's what you have with pierogies. So we're just going to take these over to our boiling station and we're gonna now boil pierogies. So as you can see, these are our pierogies already done and I did have them uncovered and you can see the color difference. And I did wanna show you that because this is just a note to make sure that you cover your pierogies after you make them. It's not gonna really hurt the pierogi too much, um, but the, the dough does dry out. So you wanna make sure that they are covered at all times. So our next step of this pierogi making adventure is actually boiling your pierogies. So I have my water already boiling. Um, you wanna use a slotted spoon. Um, I like to use this soft spoon with a mesh insert just because it's a little bit softer than a slotted spoon that I would have. Um, and then I typically take my pierogi and then I would just stick it in. Stick them in like that. And you wanna make sure that they're not touching in the water, um, but they will actually start touching and they are very easy to boil because all they do, when they're done, they pop to the surface. So it's literally seconds. If you start with a hot boiling pot of water, they will start to come to the surface and then you know that they're done. So they're almost there. My cameraman wants to focus on the pot so everyone can see that.
And you can see that they are rising. I know the joke that you're never supposed to watch a pot boil, but this is definitely a time that you need to watch a pot boil because you don't want your pierogies to be overcooked. So they are just ready. They're popping up to the top. And we are just gonna grab all of them. And another way to know that they are done, they change colors. So your pierogies are no longer a nice um, skin colored uh, dough. They are now a yellow color. So I'll show you one more time. With a few more here. Um, the best way to, uh, and those are actually almost done. So we're just gonna pop those up. So my water was just perfect temperature. So the best way to enjoy pierogies is really fresh from the hot boiling pot with some butter. However, I do enjoy pierogies anyway. So as I mentioned before, tailgating with pierogies, we always have a slow cooker full of pierogies with some butter, um, with layers of butter and onions. Um, but you can also, when you're at home, I love to make them uh, just sauteed with a little, little bit of butter and onions and then some bacon. You can also make them in your air fryer and you can also fry them. So a lot of times when you go to a fundraiser, sometimes they are fried, sometimes they are boiled. So I do have some pierogies. Already finished and there's our finished pierogies. So now we can enjoy them and now you can go make them um, at your leisure for your family and make sure your family knows that they are a labor of love and they're delicious and perfect. Back to you, Stephanie. Morgan, thank you so much for sharing that delicious looking pierogi recipe. We've shared in the chat a link to a news story that featured you. And you can also follow Morgan on Instagram because she has a lot of amazing creations and we're gonna drop the link to Morgan's Instagram in the chat as well. Now, Morgan's gonna begin the second portion of tonight's program. Um, as we mentioned earlier, she organizes events for the Pennsylvania Farm Show Complex and Expo Center in Harrisburg. So she's truly an expert in this area. The Pennsylvania Farm Show Complex and Expo Center has over a million square feet of conference rooms, large exposition halls, arenas, and banquet facilities, and hosts not only the famous Pennsylvania Farm Show, but over 200 large and small events and meetings throughout the year. Tonight, Morgan's gonna tell us about planning the Pennsylvania Farm Show virtually this year, and we have shared a link about that event also in the chat. Morgan? Thanks, Stephanie. So Penn State, um, I'm sorry, all this Penn State talk, I just wanted to talk about Penn State again. Um, but Farm Show actually ended last week, and this, this year was actually a very different year for us. Uh, it was decided late, so in, late in the summer that we would actually go virtual to keep everyone safe, everyone safe in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, this was a first in 105 years that our event became a virtual event. So all of the planning that was done from January 2020 uh, until the summer just became, um, it, it just took a, a screeching halt and we had to start over again. So the Farm Show event is hosted by the Department of Agriculture in the Farm Show Complex. And with the help of volunteers, we are able to put on a successful show every year uh, on 24 acres. So when it was decided to go virtual, the committee knew that we wanted to provide an educational experience, the same as if you were coming into the doors at the farm show. So yes, there were no milkshakes, no pork sandwiches, no cheese cubes, and everyone was pretty devastated about that. Um, but at least we could provide you with some educational fun in an atmosphere where um, every day there was something for everyone. So personally, I actually feel that the people are the best part of the show and they are the ones that actually make the show. The people are the ones that provide the experience. And we certainly miss the people this year. We miss the homecoming um, and the feeling when everyone walks through our doors and we see old faces, 
um, and we're reminded of those the stories of Farm Show. Um, but with the virtual the virtual platform that we used, it really allowed us to show uh, you the behind the scenes of the Farm Show. So it allowed you to meet the people. Um, and it allowed you to meet the, the people that were most important, that are most important to us, which are the people that uh, put food on your tables as well as fiber in your homes. And these people are the farmers. The farmers in Pennsylvania actually contribute $135 billion to the state's economy each year. So the farm show this week, um, this past week actually uh, was filled with 28 culinary demonstrations, eight farm tours, 728 competitive exhibits, uh, 10 virtual agriculture discussions with our Secretary of Agriculture, 252 farm show trail vendors, which those vendors you would have been able to see on first hand um, at the farm show normally, 18 Instagram takeovers, 18 Ag, Ag Explorer stations, which are for the kids, um, 200 videos, activities, and demonstrations for everyone on the website. We had a live duck cam and a live beehive cam, which were very popular throughout the week. And we ended each night with bedtime stories, which were a lot of fun. So the volunteers this year actually provided stories of their farms, their businesses, and students and chefs actually did their demonstrations right in their own homes, like we're doing tonight. So these are the people that actually made the 2021 virtual farm show one to remember. This year actually told the story of cultivating tomorrow through these people. So this past year, we actually had over 800,000 visitors um, from all 50 states and a few countries besides the United States. And normally at our show, we have uh, five, about 500,000 people that come through our doors and just a few states from the surrounding area. So switching gears a little bit, I do wanna take some time and talk about the complex itself. So this year at the farm show, uh, it really was unlike any other year that we've experienced. Our staff at the farm show is always resilient and constantly they um, have kept things moving throughout the year. Most years we provide um, about $300 million in economic impact to the Commonwealth withholding 200 events or more uh, that includes large commercial shows, meetings, conferences, and small events. But since March 2020, we actually uh, have not had any events inside our building. So this year we took the time and we were fortunate enough to help our community through the storage of additional food for the food banks in our area, as well as blood bank, events and some other different services that provided to our community so they could so they could prosper. So also fortunately in 2020 we started a 21 dollar 21 billion dollar capital improvement complex uh, capital improvement project in our complex. Um, so we started that in January and instead of holding shows and doing our renovations, we actually had the time to just focus on our renovations and move quicker through our projects. We have been updating our floors, our people doors, our overhead doors, roofs, windows, um, and so much more. And our staff actually took that time to fix those most needed areas in the complex, as well as paint and a few other things um, to just uh, be part of the renovation pro project. So hopefully we will see everyone soon. And um, with all of our renovations, we're excited to have you back in our home. So moving on to our Farm Show family, I did wanna talk about our team. Um, our Farm Show team is definitely family. When you have a close knit group of hard workers, the only way that you can make things work is actually trusting each other. And I think that's what makes our job at the complex uh, so easy because we always can pull together and get the job done. 
So each one of our team members at the complex brings something completely different to the table. And um, that includes our maintenance staff, our HVAC, our admin staff, um, security, and our, and our managers. Every one of us actually has their own experiences that we rely on to put on a great show. A typical month for us is actually going back and forth from clean to dirty to clean to dirty. And uh, throughout the year, we could have an agriculture show. And then uh, the agriculture show is filled with dust and dirt and manure and animals. And then the very next day, we have to be super clean for a show full of carpeting and antique cars. So a great example of this is actually in 2019, we hosted the governor's inaugural ball just three days after hosting the farm show. It was definitely a feat because one of our dirtiest halls in the complex had to be converted in no time. Our team managed it because of our diverse backgrounds and our hard work. And um, we really worked together to pull off a, a show like that. So over the years of working for the complex, I've realized that there are some really important guidelines to always follow. And I put together a list of top 10 um, reasons to put on a successful show. And Patty's gonna actually share that slide. So number one, start early. We start planning for the next farm show event as early as it is, it is over. So for our commercial shows, we will meet with our promoters for, our, for their event to determine what went well and what we can improve on. And this really allows us to start planning for the next year. Number two, develop your team. Just as I mentioned, uh, our farm show team is very diverse. So make sure to bring diverse folks to the table of your event and bring them onto your team. Number three, regulations. Know your boundaries, whether they are fire regulations or mandates in your city, know what they are and know how to um, work your show around those, those uh, regulations. Number four, use volunteers. We use volunteers to assist us in, um, during, our, during the farm show event. And they actually have the passion in promoting agriculture and the rich history that makes the show so great. Uh, their passion actually uh, shows directly through their hard work. So use volunteers. Number five, delegate tasks. So make sure each team member has a task. This allows the manager on your team to focus on managing, and this allows your team members to focus on their individual tasks. Number six, organize a schedule. So this is really important to do so early and plan ahead and determine what will work and what won't work, um, and really uh, make sure you focus on all of the necessary things right away. Number seven, determine your audience. So you can't really put a goal together for your event without determining who your audience is going to be. Um, we know at the farm show, our audience is so diverse from the families to the foodies. We, we know that they come for different reasons. Number eight, goals. So we put together goals for each of our events and each of our shows it's really important to do so, so that we know what to accomplish uh, for that event. Number nine, have a backup plan. So like 2020, we were constantly changing our plans. And as you all know, our final product was actually a virtual option. And finally, number 10, create experiences for your attendees. The reason why attendees come are to experience your show. So create those special experiences through the food, the atmosphere, and the events, and make sure they leave with a good experience in their mind and a great flavor in their taste buds. So I can now answer any questions uh, that you might have. So thank you, Morgan, for that look at what is involved in planning the farm show virtually. It sounds like it was a huge undertaking, but you rocked it. And I'm sure your top 10 tips are gonna come in handy for anyone who wants to plan a successful event. So 
as Morgan mentioned, we will now take your questions. I see we have quite a few in the Q&A. We'll get to as many as we can before we run out of time. And if we don't get to your question, um, you can certainly contact me and I am happy to um, have Morgan answer your question later. So Morgan, question number one, is there a way to make your pierogi with lower carb ingredients? Um, I'm sure that there is, but as I always say that, um, and I forgot to mention this in my presentation, but um, when I make dough food, I actually forget that I'm either on a diet that day or I need to eat healthier um, because you're making a dough product. And um, sure, there's different ways to alter, alter those products, but I have never done that with pierogies um, because I know that I'm going to enjoy those pierogies that one day, um, and then I'll go back to my diet uh, the next day. But I am sure that there is a keto-friendly recipe, um, and I'm sure that there's a recipe for um, almond flour or something like that as well. Next question, Morgan, do you keep the filling in the fridge while making the dough? Um, yes, I typically do. However, tonight I didn't. Um, but really, it depends on how many pierogies you're actually making. Because if you're making a lot of pierogies, you definitely want to keep that dough in the fridge because it has, I'm sorry, the filling in the, the fridge because it has milk in it, it could have cream cheese, it could have all those ingredients that could spoil very quickly. Um, so you definitely want to put it in the fridge. Now tonight, I was just making a few pierogies for demonstration. So I kept it out but it hasn't been out that long. Um, and really you wanna, you want to look to your Penn State Extension, food science specialists, um, and they'll probably tell you all food has to be back into the fridge within a two hour time frame. So if you're gonna be over that time frame, um, I would definitely recommend putting it back in the fridge. Can you fry pierogies instead of boiling them? You can definitely fry them. And um, a lot of churches in the area, when they do their fundraisers, they fry their pierogies. Um, they either boil them or fry them, and that's part of their fundraiser. So yeah, and they are delicious fried. They're so tasty. Can you make the potato balls ahead of time and freeze them? You could definitely do that. Um, I wouldn't, uh, I would, Definitely make sure that they are the perfect size for your pierogies though, um, if you're gonna do that. And also the freezing. I don't typically like to have frozen pierogies going straight into the boiling water, but it can be done. And um, as long as your balls are the perfect size because you won't be able to alternate them um, once they are frozen. Can the pierogies be frozen? Do you freeze before or after cooking? Yes. Um, they can be frozen both ways. Um, actually, you can, I, I like to make my pierogies and not have them for dinner that day. Um, I will actually make the pierogies and have them all done. And as long as you separate them on a tray, like uh, what we have here, um, just shove that right back into the freezer and freeze them so they are not touching each other. And then once they have been frozen for maybe an hour or so, then you can actually stick them in any sort of other container so they are overlapping. Um, so that is uh, just telling you how to do it before you boil. So after you boil, you can really do the same thing. Um, I like to separate them and then stick them in the freezer for later consumption. Mary Ellen says, my ancestors are from Czechoslovakia. I grew up in southwestern Pennsylvania eating potato-filled pierogies and prune-filled pierogies. I know they sound gross, but they're actually delicious. Have you ever made prune-filled pierogies? I have not, but I definitely um, would try it because I am a foodie, so I like everything. And that sounds so interesting to me. Um, I probably will make my next batch of pierogies just like that. Um, but I am not a, a, a Polish descent at all. I'm German and Italian. Um, so I, I really just like to make it any sort of way because I am a foodie. So thank you so much for the recommendation. I will definitely try it. Tracy wants to know if you've ever used boxed mashed potatoes. Um, that's really funny because I have done that. Um, I received a packet of potato flakes, which is very similar to the boxed mashed potatoes um, that you can buy. And I did try it before. 
Um, and you can, you can definitely do that because it's just a, a mashed potato filling. So really, I mean, I wouldn't recommend it because you're making all fresh ingredients, you know, a fresh pierogi. So why not make the fresh uh, mashed potatoes anyway? Um, but you can definitely try it and do it. Dave would like to know, do you ever make your pierogies as a family affair? My wife's family splits up the jobs and the whole family gets involved. I want to be the pincher. Yeah, um, I definitely look forward to doing that. My son is just a little too young for that. Um, he is going to turn one in a few weeks. So he's just a little too young. We did try cookies with him um, and it it worked out okay with super with a lot of supervision. Um, but I definitely want to try that someday. I am mostly in the kitchen. So um, my husband loves to cook with me as well. But since we have a little one, it's just really hard to do that. Um, but yes, I will definitely try to do that. And he will be the one, our child will be the one pinching because it's so much fun. Melanie asks, the farm fair recipes for kids, did you lead that activity or provide instructions? Um, the kids uh, cooking recipes, I did not lead that recipe um, adventure for the farm show at all. I was actually in charge of the Instagram takeovers, which were a lot of fun behind the scenes farm um, takes. And then I assisted with the ag exforestations. However, the kids um, cooking, that was so much fun. And I loved every moment of it. I was definitely kept on the edge of my seat the entire week. Um, but they were a lot of fun. And I recommend anyone to view those recipes. That was part of our uh, Pennsylvania Preferred Culinary Kitchen that determined that as well as our assistant director who, is, who assisted with those recipes and the ideas behind it. How about different cheeses? Anne wants to know, horseradish? Definitely horseradish and any sort of cheese. I love the cheddar. My family likes the cheddar better. Um, oh, and I just rhymed cheddar better. Um, but you can do any sort of cheese at all. I like the cheddar flavor with the ranch seasoning the best because I think it just pairs really nicely together. Um, you can certainly use American or any other cheese really. And I would recommend definitely experimenting with that. And I love the horseradish idea. That sounds so fun. Nancy wants to know if you've made them with sauerkraut. I have not made them with sauerkraut, um, but I've heard that that is uh, definitely a Polish recipe um, and I'd love to try it. And our final question, Karen, do you suggest to boil them first, then fry them? Um, no, you actually don't have to. You can just stick them right in the fryer um, and fry them right away. But I tend to boil everything before I fry it. Um, but, but yeah, you don't have to. Thank you. And that was our last question. If you have additional questions um, after you log off this evening, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to get answers from Morgan. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight. All the links we shared in the chat, as well as Morgan's recipe, will be sent via email tomorrow. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the evening, one of the reasons that we organized this cooking classic is to raise awareness of the continual plight of students' food insecurity. We've shared in the chat a link to our fundraising page. All the money that's raised will go to the food pantry that you select in the drop-down box. And keep in mind that every $5 provides 20 or more meals, a small price to pay to ease a student's worry about where they're gonna get their next meal. Given the incredibly trying year that it's been, we hope you can help. Thank you again so much to our presenter this evening, Morgan Firestein, and we hope to see you all January 27th at seven o'clock for our next webinar in the Cooking Classic series, Cooking with Tech, Wings and Things. We are. <laughs>